This first session will focus on how to create long-term platforms of exchange and cooperation between regional peace through sports stakeholders. With that being said, please let's welcome on stage an individual who has demonstrated that cooperation, dialogue and commitment can bring positive impact to a nation. Ms. Widad Bouchamawi, Nobel Prize winner laureate 2015 and member of the Tunisian National Quartet. Dear Governor, dear Joel Bouzou, President and Founder of Peace and Sport, Ministers, dear Champions, ladies and gentlemen, allow me first to thank you for your kind invitation. It's with an immense honor and great emotion that I stand before you once again. Thank you so much. I'd like to speak with my heart as Nobel Peace Prize laureate, as women, and as a lover of sport and peace. I think our collective ambition, all of us, is to give a better life, working day after day to establish and promote human rights and individual freedom, to strengthen the principles of justice, democracy, equality, tolerance, and dialogue through sports. It's well known that the role of youth in building a society of peace and progress is unavoidable. But what do you offer today to these young people? Reality always catches up with us because we have no magic wands or the financial means to stop poverty and so, social injustice, especially in the, the disadvantaged areas that are often located in the most remote areas or in slums. Young people are frustrated and uncomfortable because they have little or no means to live with dignity despite the efforts. Facts are terrible. Every five minutes, one child dies because of violence. Every minute, 28 girls are married before they turn 18 years. 3.7 million children have only experienced war. 85 million children are victims of la forced labor. And yet, every child has basic rights to care, education, justice, and protection. It's therefore a duty for us to raise our voices, to propose ways to guide states, civil societies, organizations, and what a better forum than peace and sports, and ever reaffirm how much the real spirit of sport can make it possible. Possible for everyone, everywhere, to believe in a better life and a better future, a peaceful future. Because peace is a building where every stone counts, every material acts on its construction, its consolidation, and its durability. Peace and sport, offices team, sport champions, volunteers in the fields are the heroes of the, are the hurries. This is how I see the peaceful struggle to bring peace to the world. Peace and sports is part of humanistic values, transmitting universal and timeless message of peace and tolerance through sports. The language of body, heart, and mind, each person here is committed to this and I thank each and every one of them. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for these inspiring words. At this point, let's welcome Taekwondo Olympic medalist and champion for peace, Ms. Marlene Arnois, who will moderate the first plenary session. Good morning, Excellencies, President, Champions for Peace, and dear friends. Welcome to the Peace in Sport Regional Forum. This first session will focus on the role of sport, creating peaceful communities, networks, and regional cooperation. This morning, we have the privilege to have with us an outstanding panel of leaders whom have achieved a positive impact by creating powerful tools for development and peace and by using the values of sports to bring communities together. So over the course of the next hour, they will share with us the challenges they have experienced, as well as the opportunities and successes that have emerged from their initiatives. It is my great pleasure to call on stage Ms. Madeline Hong, co-founder of The Good Country, Mr. Lazaros Papadopoulos, former basketball player and founder of Atlanta, and Mr. Alex Canals, representative for the FC Barcelona Foundation. Thank you all for joining me on stage. Our first speaker is an impressive young leader and visionary. After obtaining a bachelor degree in social science at Harvard University, she engaged in promoting peace and has co-founded Good Country. The online initiative believes the country should be defined by values instead of borders, and it aims to tackle global challenges in several different ways. Ms. Malin Hong, welcome. Thank you so much, Marlon, and thank you for having me here. You know, sporting events have long shown us the power of sport to bridge even the starkest social divides and bring people together. Um, as competitors, athletes know well that failure to agree to and play by a shared set of rules undermines the game itself. Lack of sportsmanship and basic respect for another human being and one's opponent renders winning meaningless. Um, after all, what does it mean to engage a competitor who you regard as non-human? And of course, sport offers the opportunity to bring together everyone and anyone on the same team, to draw out each other's strengths, to collectively problem solve, and to work towards shared goals. But today, I want to challenge everyone to think about the ways in which sport could do even more outside the game. In other words, what are the consequences we want to see and can expect from sport once the game stops? I don't have all the answers, of course, but I have some questions. Sport shows us how the right balance of cooperation and competition can elevate the standard of play, but really drive human progress. So how do we bottle up the spirit of sportsmanship and apply it to completely different arenas? How can we inject these values in places where they're so badly needed? If we take peace to mean not just the absence of conflict, but the space for meaningful cooperation and collaboration, how can we use sport to create truly peaceful communities? What kind of sportsmanship can we aspire to 
in the 21st century and in the age of globalization. This is something we've been thinking about a lot recently at The Good Country, which is the country that my co-founder Simon Anholt and I launched last month. Uh, that's right, I said a new country. We started a new country. And a country designed to show other countries how to be better team players. Because we know that unless we, as the world, start acting like we're on the same team, we're not going to survive some of the most pressing global challenges of our day. I'm talking about climate change, I'm talking about pandemics, economic stability, weapons proliferation, you name it. Unless we start working together a lot more and competing just a little bit less, game over. So the good country is a country whose only interest is the international interest. A country who brings together people from all around the world who believe that the global challenges are the main challenges. People who would rather see humanity make it to the next generation than see their own country win a short-term advantage. And yes, these people do really exist. In fact, our research from the past five years suggests that 10% of the world's population have shared values to the good country and may well consider citizenship. That's 760 million people. And if the good country reaches all of these people, it will make it the third largest country by population in the world. Now, good country citizens, like citizens of any other country, agree to a basic social contract. So they pay $5 in annual tax, and in exchange, they participate in decision-making around what issues the country will tackle and what actions it will carry out in the world. Which is to say that if and when the good country reaches all of those potential citizens, all 760 million of them, the good country may also be a very powerful actor with something in the range of $4 billion in annual tax revenue to implement policy. And when I say implement policy, I mean it very broadly, because another core feature of how we'll work is to draw on as many different kinds of diplomacy and influence as possible, whether that be through education, through traditional foreign policy, through use of our economic power, um, or through arts and culture. So while we're new to this field of peace and sport, we want to learn from you, we want to amplify the work that you're already doing, and push it even further. So if you're an athlete, a member of government, a humanitarian, or a potential citizen who's interested in discussion, we love to talk about how we can bring together more cooperative, more collaborative, peaceful communities through sport. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is a former basketball player, two times Euro League champion, European champion, and vice world champion. After reaching all of his goals as a member of the Greek national team, he was driven by the desire to help younger players showcase their talent in order to get scouted. He then founded Atlanta, a global recruitment platform promoting athletes from everywhere in the world, even from refugee camps. Congratulations, Mr. Lazardos Papadopoulos. Thank you for me. I have the same problem all the time with the microphone. Uh, so let's play the video.
I came from Africa, uh, I'm from Congo. I traveled to Congo and uh, came to Turkey and Turkey. I came here. So it was not uh, so easy to, for me to let my family and uh, let my country, let uh, everything go to another country and the country who I don't know no one. I'm like, uh, I'm alone in a uh, jungle or something like. Πρώτη φορά όταν είδα το κρίσι συγκινήθηκα και συγκινήθηκα όχι το τρόπο που βάζει καλάθια ή τα σωματικά του προσόντα, το πώς πηδάει, το τι δύναμη έχει, συγκινήθηκα από τη θέλησή του. Δηλαδή όταν πρώτη φορά κάθισε και έμεινε στο σπίτι μου και στις 6 η ώρα το πρωί ξύπνησε για να πάρει μια μπάλα να παίξει, είναι κάτι το οποίο σίγουρα δεν μ' άφησα διάφορο. Το μπάσκετμπολ, νομίζω, είναι το πιο σημαντικό στην ζωή μου. I live for basket. I start to learn my basket to watch uh, NBA, you know, the video every time. So when I watch the NBA movie, I try to make the same thing. So without the basket, I can't. I can't stay like two days, three days, no practice. I can't. All the time I want only to stay in the court, stay near to the ball, feel the ball in my hand. Σε αυτή την περίπτωση σίγουρα η τεχνολογία βοηθάει. Και δεν βοηθάει απλώς έναν αθλητή, βοηθάει έναν άνθρωπο. My dream is one day to be an NBA player. That is my dream. One day. Επιλέξαμε τον Γκρίς μέσα από το αθλέτα καρία πρόγραμμα. Η αθλέντα είναι το που ανοίγει το πρόγραμμα. So actually, this is Athlend, and I'll explain what exactly we do. We empower the athlete dream. And to give one example, uh, all of us here, we are different. We are from different countries. We have different religions. We speak the different languages. We are a different color, but we have the same feeling, the feeling to be athlete. And it doesn't matter what level we have played. We are professional, or we are amateur, or we are just a fan. All of us, at least one, have a dream. A dream to be Michael Jordan, to be a Ronaldo, to be a Messi. And this dream is so strong, it's so emotional. And those dreams have the same exactly dreams have the kids in Congo, in Nigeria, in all Africa. But those kids don't have the result, the resources. They don't have the court, they don't have the, the shoes to play their sports. And what we do, we empower those athlete dream. With innovation, with technology, we can change the world. We can give the opportunity to these kids to, to show their talent, not just specific to one club or to one organization, but to all the world. We want to change the world and we want to change the sports world industry and we want to make this dream happen. Thank you. Thank you for this powerful speech. Committed to the refugee populations and especially with refugee children, the Barca Foundation has launched programs using sport as a tool for social transformation and partners with organizations such as UNHCR and the Starvros Niarcos Foundation to raise awareness on youth refugees and improve their life conditions. Representing the FC Barcelona Foundation, Alex Canals. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be invited at the Sport Forum to share with you all the work we've been doing in, 
in the, in the context of the Mediterranean region. And I would like to share with you a little bit with what, what we do as a foundation and also what are our programs about. So to start, uh, the, the Barcelona Foundation, Barcelona Foundation is the, is the driver for Football Club Barcelona Corporate Social Responsibility. And our mission is to support children and youth through sport and education to provide and to contribute a most, more egalitarian and more uh, inclusive society. So we work in three main areas. We work in prevention of violence. We work also on promote social inclusion. And also we work for reinforcement and access to, of education. On this way, uh, we work in four main ways. We, for example, we have our own programs that we develop around the, around the world, in Catalonia and internationally. Also, we raise awareness and run campaigns. We also, we also have, um, sorry, we also have uh, collaborations with, we also have, oh, sorry. <laughs> We also have collaborations with leading institutions such as UNICEF in order to achieve the development sustainable goals. And we contribute to knowledge generation uh, around the issues that, we, I, that I felt told before. Um, at the heart of our programs, we find football net. Football net in Catalan means fair football. And is a program that born in 2012 in Catalonia, and FAST was, extern was, exp was extended to over the world. Now we are in more than 50 countries, and we have over 1 million children in the Football Net programs. Mm, Football Net program is a social program. It's not an academy. We go away of this fact. We, it's a social program where we work values, we teach values through a sport. This program is run by educators in the, that we train in this methodology. And on this way, they teach the children. And we have trained during this year more than 100 coaches, and we provide the sessions to more than 3,000 children and youth. What also makes FootballNet a useful tool is the easy way of adaptation that it has to the context and different issues. For example, we have the programs in the favelas of Brazil and Argentina. And there we work for prevention of violence, but also in Indonesia and Bangladesh, for example, we work for reinforcement of the education. Since 2017, we start developing these programs in the Mediterranean region in the context of refugee crisis uh, through the partnership of Stavros Niarchos Foundation and in the, with the aim of improve the emotional and physical well-being of the refugee children, as well as promoting an integration between local community and the refugee community. We work in three different countries. We work in Italy with una company of minors from first accommodation centers. We also work in Lebanon, in Beka Valley. It's in the border with Syria where we mix population, Lebanese population and refugee, and also in Greece, in Athens and Lesbos, in public schools and also in different refugee camps. An external evaluation was done in the programs and, different, and we achieved different positive outcomes, including the project provides critical safe spaces in such a difficult environment, there is a high satisfaction and also attendance from children. Most of them, they were, they were talking that was the only activity they were waiting for during the whole day. Also participants feel calmer, less aggressive, and, and less fearsome. It means that the emotional well-being of the children has been improved during this last year. The evaluation shows that in less than 25 sessions, they have changed and a lot in their emotional well-being. When they arrive, they feel they have fear, they have traumas, 
It's sometimes it's children that they need a lot of attention. And with just a few sessions, you can see how they can open their minds, they can relax, and they can enjoy again of having fun, playing games, playing matches, meeting new people, having new friends. Participants also created a strong bond between them. That's a really important thing that sports provides that doesn't matter where you're from, when you are playing together, you don't have any difference in terms of culture, in terms of religion. You are just having fun, you are enjoying, and sometimes you don't need even to talk at the beginning. And then you will start having new friends you can share with them and learn more. Respectful and tolerant attitudes were observed um, during this year too. The, spe the specific dynamics that the Football Net program provides uh, helps, helps to contribute the, to neutralizing the cultural differences and religion the stereotypes, and it encourages the intercultural dialogue. In our methodology, we work with a combination of games, matches, but also reflection spaces. Reflection spaces where the children can be the main actor, where they are asked, they can share, they can give their opinions, they can feel that they are part of a, of a world group where the educator doesn't become a teacher on a different way of them, it stays on the same way as the children, give them the opportunity to share, to express, and to live. Um, increased confidence also on, on communication skills. It's another thing that we can identify with the sports programs. And boys accepted after a few sessions to play with girls, also to also inside and outside the field. So just to finish, uh, looking forward, we are committed in three main ways for next season. First one is to continue providing and offering football net programs to um, the three countries. Also, we are emphasizing knowledge transfer to the football net methodology to government structures, also institutions, partners, organizations, to build their capacity to integrate sport as a tool to engage both refugee and host population. And third, and to conclude, FC Barcelona is committed to, prov to provide a voice to refugee children and young people to communicate to the world that each child and each young people have rights being as a human being and they have the right to learn, the right to play and the right to, be, to live their childhood. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you for your great contribution. Before opening up the discussion with Q and A's, I wanted to learn more on the role sport has played and how it has allowed you to achieve impact. Ms. Hong, what role does sport play in a good country? Thank you so much. So you know, the, the good country is a, is a new initiative. Uh, we launched just under a month ago, um, and we'll be going through a, about a year-long trial period until next September 2019, when we'll be uh, launching for good and bringing hopefully those 760 million citizens on board. So right now, this is a time for us to be um, really experimenting with the different ways that we can achieve impact um, and influence both countries and other actors internationally. Um, and we have a, a huge interest in, in many different kinds of, of diplomacy. Um, for example, through sport. Um, you know, I identified some when I was um, giving my opening remarks, but we see um, the, one of the advantages of creating a new country is that it gives us a lot of, of flexibility to be dynamic and try really different ways um, of engaging other actors, uh, whether that be through in inspiring um, other actors to do the right thing. I uh, think sport is a potentially an incredible tool to do that. You know, at the end of the day, um, more people process information here than they do here. And I think that sport offers one of the one of the best ways to do that. So we really look forward to to trying out uh, trying our hand at, at using sport in, in those ways over the next year. Congratulations, and you can count me in as a good country citizen. Um, 
Mr. Papadopoulos, um, we saw from the video, Chris Wamba's journey, is, it's so powerful. What is the impact on youth in refugee camp and how has it inspired younger generations? Yeah, the story is it's really impressive and the impact is that all the people in the world have the chance and they have the chance with the, the, with the technology. It's very difficult before that for the kids to show their talent. And you know, in the young, in the young age, one kid like 16, 17, 18 years old, he has like three solutions to show himself. After that, when he come 19 or 20 years old, he's stopped to be a talent. He go to make something other, you know, he has a job, he has education. And in this critical age, the talent stop, you know, and the dream that he have make just stop. So he has only, actually he has only three choice to make this click and to, to go to make his dream happen. Today with the technology, we give this power to the people to show the talents. Through the technology, we can show the talent to all the world. And this is the, the biggest impact. We don't want any talent to get lost. We want to help these kids to, to, to create, to, to make this dream. Congratulations. Looking back at the implementation of the Football Net program, what were the biggest challenges and how did you overcome them in order to succeed? So, of course, last year was the first year we started to work with refugees and for us it was a new experience and we had to learn a lot from that. For example, when we first arrived in a refugee camp and we started the program, we didn't figure out that we will have language issues. It was a really it was really difficult. There was a really big barrier, language barrier, between the educators and the children. So at this point, we react and we had to involve the community around. We had to involve parents. We have to involve other people interested on be part of the program in a way to help us with translations. And the program had to to be translated sometimes in more than three languages. Also, we were, also the, the children were helping other children to translate what the educator was talking about or the opinions that they were sharing between them. Other issues, for example, that we faced, it was the conflict situations. We found children that are really touched for their travels, and then we had to work with them also to make them feel safe, to make them feel that they have a space where they can share, they can be a child again, they can enjoy. And so it was also a hard work for the educators to be patient, to give love, and to be patient with those guys and girls. Other issues we faced, also there was a complicated aspect. We had to find the correct NGOs to implement our programs on the field. It's, it was also a difficult part to do it. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing your experiences with such passion. As we still have about 10 minutes to go, I would like to open the conversation and invite the public to participate in the Q&A. But as time is limited, um, please, if we have a few questions. Questions from the public? Thank you very much. My name is Alferio Morrison Nchimbi, Secretary General for Tanzania Baseball and Softball Association. I'm very much inspired with the Lazarus Papadopoulos approach. You know, Tanzania is surrounded by uh, Congo DRC, uh, South Sudan, Burundi, and uh, most, most of the refugee camps are in Tanzania in our country. And you can see that uh, refugees in our countries, they are there, but they need to be introduced by the element of sports in their camps. So as when they go back, they can go with their talents. So the same approach, I would like to penetrate into refugee camps and make it, it is very uh, tough situation for them in their camps. They don't have the equipment, and, something, and even uh, coaches is, uh, to introduce them. And also to 
go into the camps. It is, it is very much difficult, bureaucratic, you know, it's not easy. So it's better for peace and uh, sport to gain something, how to enter and introduce. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, you know, traditionally we would always try to, to help this country, this emerging market, and we try to do this like we create a camps, we, we send the players, we create a tournament, but the technology have so much power so we can help not only one or ten or hundred uh, people, we can, we can help like all the young kids and this is, uh, this is that innovation will come. Today we have 2018 and we really can do this. We just need to, to put this, uh, this innovation, this technology to this country and like this we can help a lot of players. I have a question myself. Um, so this powerful platform now, it's uh, for basketball. Are there any further projects to open it up to different sports? Yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, we start like a, like a basketball because we need to make proof of concept. We need to, to make the first version to see our mistake. And uh, after that, we need investment to, to change this platform to all kinds of sports and to, pen to penetrate. It's the one thing is to create the platform. And the second thing, that the most difficult thing is to put this platform to, 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 the, to the market to make this platform in all the region to be known and all the athletes to come to this platform and all the athletes to show their talents and then it, that this timing, this critical moment, we can really change the sports industry. And I believe that it's, it's as much as a challenge to find, because the goal is for them to get scouted. So you need the agents, you need the universities, and yes. other actors yes, as well. Yes, they have many barriers. They have barriers, not only the agents or the scouts. They have the, the, the biggest uh, barriers is the financial, the travel. They play in some small village and really anybody don't, don't watch them. And our biggest power like platform like Atlanta, it's, it's to find financial because all of them, all of the time that we come to, to pitching this idea, all of them looking like PNL or cash flow, they don't see the main uh, reason of this platform. And the main reason of this platform is to help these kids. So when we change and when we get, uh, get break this barrier, we really can change the sports industry. Perfect, thank you. Um, if there are another question for the public, Yeah, um, my name is Piero Ngadi. I'm a member of a Cycle of Universal Ambassador of Peace. Uh, I live in Ireland, but I do go to the Congo. I'm really impressed for the video I, 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 I saw. And uh, also, Congo is a second largest country in Africa, but people have lost hope because of the conflict. When people are talking here about peace, I see, I think that we need that peace. Peace in sport, as we hear here in uh, the conference. If people are there willing to change really the mind of the people, mainly in the Congo, we is border with nine countries, but ravaged by the conflicts. How the sport, can help not people just to talk about refugees to come over, but to change the mind of young people there to give tools that they can work, live in peace. That all we are talking here with love. If we change the mind of the young people, we'll be good. But without financial, without support, really we'll see people moving from Africa coming over because of the conflict, because of to change their life and to gain hope. How peace and sport can change just the life in this country instead of coming over? That's my question, concern. Yes, it's for all the three speakers. Oh, okay, i start first. Uh, how we can change this? Uh, 
like I say, we, we change this with, with the hope. You say correct that we hope when we watch something. And what's happened when we watch one game? What's happened when we, we watch Michael Jordan? We, we, we hope, we dream that, like in, my, in our mind happened that we are there. Like in, when, when we are young kids, we are dreaming to be there and uh, that's why we come to the practice and that's why we working hard because we have this goal, we have this objective. So when we organize this, this event, we give the hope and with the technology we can hope, we can make this hope powerful, we can scale with this, we can do this 100,000 million times much faster and much uh, better. So we need to, to give this hope and only like this uh, we give the motivation for uh, young kids. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I know I think, it's a, I think it's a really good question and I think whether you're talking about conflict within a single country like Congo or whether you're talking about conflict between countries or even not just express conflict but tension and, and I know that this is something I brought up earlier, you know, what, can, what kind of sportsmanship can we aspire to in the age of globalization? We're constantly coming into contact with new cultures and different kinds of people that we didn't you know, even 5, 10, 15 years ago, how can we use uh, sport as a common language to start negotiating those differences? And I think it's, it's, an, it's not the entire package. I think there are other elements of cultural understanding that we need to layer on top of it, but I think it can be a really, really important entry point, and that's kind of what I was uh, thinking about when I was talking about, you know, how do we define um, an, the, new, the new sportsmanship of the 21st century? Good point. Um, as time is limited, we'll have uh, we'll only have time for one last question. Please, I think here. Please opt for short and direct questions. Um, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to ask a question. My name is Mikey. I'm from Congo, but I live in Hong Kong. So my question is uh, because we have a uh, I'm a football player, I play in Hong Kong. We have uh, creating a team which uh, we get uh, many players, are uh, refugees and ethnic minority, which um, in Hong Kong sports is not really unseen like all the world. So we are giving them a chance for training and expressing themselves through sport. But there's a problem. We cannot make it for them um, to make their dream come true. So my question to you is, how, if uh, one day you have a chance to come to help us, to tell us how we can make them so they can make their dream come true in the future because we are trying and Hong Kong is not really open for sport. So that was my question. Thank you. So I think in that way it's about putting all the efforts, continue working hard on trying to let the people know about the sport and the benefits that it has for the population. And at the same time, so involving as many people as you could on doing it. And for example, we are not in Hong Kong, but also I think in many, many parts of Asia, it continues being like that. It's hard for the children to have access to sports because they have other they have to help at home, they have to work, there's many problems to, and many issues to solve, but I think we have to keep working hard on being there and, and include those children and give them the right to, to be part of, of the sport and, and allows their access to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Please stay for a picture. One more round of applause to everybody.